Okay, good morning. So let's talk about composition today. Let's see, we got that video out of the way. Right, there we go. So, composition. Uh, Zoom is doing the thing where there's an input delay. Mm. Composition. Ooh. Sorry about the technology. Um, composition is a way of putting functions together. Where the output of one function is the input of the other. So probably the easiest way to depict composition is using arrow diagrams. Let's say we have two functions and we'll just keep these really simple. We won't uh, like we won't put a formula on the board, but one function takes the numbers one and two and three, and it sends them to four, negative one, and seven. Just uh, coming up with numbers at random here. Maybe one goes to four, Two goes to negative one, three goes to seven. Okay, that's a function. And now maybe you have a second function. And this second function has as its domain, the range of the first function. Uh, let me make that circle a little bigger so that I'm not scrunched up. And let's say we have, oh, whatever, zero, four, and six. So the second function sends four to zero, negative one to four, and seven to six. So that's in the situation we might find ourselves in. It probably seems pretty artificial with the way I have it laid out, but this shows up a lot in very applied contexts. And the composition of these two functions is found by following the arrows. So it's going to be a function that has a range of zero, four, and six. And 
and a domain of one and two and three. And following the arrows, one goes to four, and then four goes to zero. So the composition sends one to zero. Two goes to negative one, goes to four. So two is sent to four. Three goes to seven, goes to six. So three goes to six. So this is composition. Um, in terms of notation, composition has kind of weird notation, or at least it might seem weird, I don't know. Um, but if we call one of the functions, no, let's stick with lacking. If we call this first function f of x, plus u, and we call the second function g of x, then the composition is written either like that or like this. Two different ways of expressing exactly the same thing. And the reason I said this was sort of odd notation or potentially odd notation, notice that composition is written in the reverse order from what you're used to. Uh, that is, if you look at what's happening up here, we start with one, we hit it with f of x to get four, then we hit it with g of x to get zero. So f comes first, g comes second. When we write the composition, g comes first, f comes second. And we, the textbook, and therefore us, because we are following the textbook, will want to um, talk about the composition in a few ways, but really, arrow diagrams um, and formulas are the two ways to talk about composition. Like, Graphs, for example, it's really hard to look at two graphs and get any intuition about what the composition is going to look like. But the textbook likes its machines. A lot of textbooks like their machines. This was some kind of revolution in pedagogy at some point. If you wanted to represent composition using the, um, these machine diagrams, well, the output of the first function is feeding directly into the second function. And I always say that composition cuts out to the middle man, because when you create these diagrams, the composition always ends up being from the first thing in the diagram to the last thing in the diagram, and the middle of the diagram sort of gets erased. 
you saw the same thing here, where we um, wrote down these three functions, and then when we wrote down the composition function, this whole middle part vanished. So composition shows up a lot in real world applications. Um, as an example, we might consider, for example, uh, repeating myself there, but we might look at a bar's revenue, or let's say a restaurant's revenue. Um, a restaurant's revenue is going to depend on the number of patrons. So we can imagine a function that takes the number of patrons in the restaurant and outputs the restaurant's revenue. Or let's say average revenue. Of course, you know, the details may vary from night to night, but maybe the restaurant finds that on average, everyone spends $20 there, and their revenue is 20 times the number of patrons. Well, the number of patrons might in turn depend on the temperature. If it's bitterly cold out, people might not want to go out to eat. They might prefer to just order in. So you can imagine a function that goes from temperature as its input and gives you the number of patrons as its output. From here, this restaurant has fixed costs. I mean, it wouldn't want to open if it thinks that the revenue it's going to earn is less than the cost for um, paying the waiters and the cost for paying electricity and all of that other stuff. So the restaurant may look at the thermometer and see um, negative 10 and wonder, well, should we bother opening? What kind of revenue are we going to get when it's negative 10 outside? So in that situation, they want to look at the temperature and they want to make predictions about the revenue that they're going to earn. They don't care um, specifically about the number of patrons. They just want to look at the temperature and estimate their revenue. So a situation like this is where composition shows up. And I mean, lots of situations, I mean, this is, Slightly a ben, slightly banal example, but it's one that I always give my college algebra students, where you've got an expanding or that's not talk like a weird alien. 
let's say, inflating balloon. So let's treat this balloon as if it's spherical and we're blowing it up. And as time passes, the balloon inflates. One function that you might create could be a function from a time a radius. If you've been blowing up the balloon for however many seconds, the balloon will have such and such a radius. Another function that you might create, in fact, a very famous function, is the volume function. Um, the volume of a sphere depends on its radius. And what composition would allow you to do is cut out the middle man, as it were, and just say, well, if you've been blowing, if you've been expanding this balloon for five seconds, what's the volume? And using this example as our basis, let's, um, let's actually do composition. How, does, how is composition done when we have formed them? So we've seen it pictured with machines. We've seen it pictured with arrow diagrams. But now we'd like to actually do it with Formulas. So let's say that our functions are this. This is not a scientifically realistic formula, but oh well. Let's say. that will measure time in seconds and R in inches. And the radius of the balloon after T seconds will be two plus 0 0.4 times T inches. Now, B of R I I won't test to see if you know this. Um, this is one of the form of those we probably all learn in high school and then never think about again. But the volume of a balloon with radius of a sphere with radius r is four thirds pi r cubed, where here r is in inches and um, the volume is in inches cubed. And composition is written in reverse order. So as we're reading this diagram from left to right, you see R, then you see V. But when we write down the composition, we write down V, R of T. We write the V first, then the R. 
And this is the notation that I think is most useful. Your textbook seems really taken with this open dot notation. I mean, it is perfectly standard notation, but as far as actually doing the composition, I find this notation to be the best. And let's write down, let's give ourselves some space to work with. And now let's actually do the composition. And the thing about doing composition is that it's really not special. You evaluate the composition the same way that you'd evaluate any other function. So let me give some examples of what I mean by this. Suppose I want to know what is the volume when the radius is three inches? Now, the way this notation works, if I want to know what happens when the radius is three, I just go down to that equation, and every time the radius appears, I replace it with three. Four thirds pi three cubed. What is the volume when the radius is seven inches? Well, again, V of seven is four thirds times pi times seven cubed. So these are two unrelated examples that we're doing just to make sure we're on the same page about how this function notation works. Because if we're on the same page, then we know how to find V of R of T. It's four thirds times pi times R of T cubed. And what is R of T? It's two plus zero point four T. So this is four thirds times pi times two plus zero point four T cubed. And there's your composition. This is the function that takes time as its input. And gives volume as its output and does not have any mention of radius.
um, that cuts out the middle man and just goes from time to void. Any questions so far? Then we can do this even if our functions are a little more complex. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at this example. Um, the revenue, the temperature to patrons to revenue example. And I, I feel like when I said that, I was just uh, spitting words at random. Sorry when that happens, it's my ADD acting up. From temperature to patrons to revenue. And I have no idea what they have what a realistic temperature to patrons function would look like. So I am just going to completely make something up. Let's say that P of T is 50 plus the square root of T minus with it, sure. The square root of T minus 70. As an as a real world function, this would have the unfortunate property of giving you a an imaginary number of patrons when it's less than 70 degrees out. But for a um, for a classroom exercise, it will do. And let's say the revenue as a function of patrons, um, maybe on average, every patron spends $42. So we've got a function from temperature to patrons, and we've got another function from patrons to revenue. And again, our theoretical restaurant owner um, who is looking at the temperature forecast for tomorrow, maybe doesn't really care about the number of patrons. They just want to know what kind of revenue to expect if they open. And again, Composition is written in reverse order. So it's R of P of T. So giving us a little space to work with. Minus seventy um, R of P equals forty two P, and the function we're looking for, the composition that we want is R of P of T. 
And again, the reason why I really like this notation, and the reason why I'm less fond of this open circle notation, is that I think this notation really drives home what's happening here. You know, if we had R of two, we just go up here and let P be two. If we had R of 20, we just go up here and let P be 20. If we have R of P of T, Well, we let P be P of T. And then because we know what P of T is, it's 50 plus the square root of T minus 70. We can write down our composition. Um, remember that this last step is very important because remember what our goal is. Our goal is to take time as an input and give, in this case, it's revenue, but give revenue as an output. So this variable here, this time variable, has to be the variable on the far right. So it's very important to do that substitution so that you have the correct variable there. So I don't know quite how many more examples I want to do. This could become a little tedious, but let's see, what are the other sort of classic examples? What I'd like to do, what I'd like to do is have an example where the variable shows up more than once. So maybe something like the number of eggs a restaurant uses per week depends on the average number of customers. So let's say that, again, not worrying here about whether this is a realistic equation, just sort of making something up. Let's say E of C equals 50 plus the square root of C plus C squared. And let's now say this restaurant opened relatively recently 
And as sort of word of mouth has spread, the number of customers this restaurant is getting is also changing. So let's say the average number of customers years after opening is C of T equals five hundred plus the square root of t. And let's state a goal goal that's find a function that will take the number of years the restaurant's been open and spit out the number of eggs that the restaurant uses per week and does not refer in any way to the number of customers the restaurant has. So in a situation like this, you have to, I mean, I guess in a situation like this as well, but here I kind of, I drew the diagram for you. So you could see, well, first there's P of T, then there's R of P, but composition is written in reverse order. So R of P of T, Here, I don't have that diagram written. I always find it useful. I mean, we've got a function that goes from years to customers. And we also have a function that goes from customers to eggs. The only way we can put these functions together, remember that the output of the first function and the input of the second function have to match. The only way these functions can go together is like this. And fortunately, composition, which cuts out the middle man, does exactly what we want. We want to go from years to eggs, if we take this composition, we will go from years to eggs. And the reason I'm taking the time to write down this diagram um, is that, I mean, mathematically, there are two compositions you can do. I mean, the Composition we are looking for, here's E of C, here's C 
from the T was my variable, that's right. So the composition we're looking for is E of C of T. And the number one mistake that students tend to make when they're asked to do compositions is to do the composition in the wrong order. And when you're doing composition, order matters. If you do this, you're just going to get completely the wrong answer. So I always struggle to, to get students to create these diagrams. There's this, this tendency I feel like to be like, Oh, I'm just, no, I'm just going to jump right in and do the problem. I don't want to draw pictures, but at least I always think that drawing the pictures is really helpful. So let's, let's see if we can do this on this frame. Our formulas are nastier. Fifty plus the square root of C plus C squared. And again, I don't suppose this is very realistic, but my reason for making the egg function look the way it looks is that I wanted an example where the um, variable shows up more than once. So when we find E of C of T, Every reference to C is going to be replaced with C of T. So because C shows up twice under the square root and in the square, C of T shows up twice. And then when we do our substitution step, we need to replace both the C of T's. Sorry for the tiny writing. I didn't maybe allow myself enough space. We replace both the C of T's with what C of T is. So we have a square root under a square root, which is fine. And there's our function. And the variable t shows up more than once, which is perfectly admissible. It's perfectly fine. Um, if, if you've seen quadratics, well, that happens there too. All right, so I'll get you um, get you your tests back by by Friday. I have.